All right, we're going to get started with uh, Sister Damian Marie giving a welcome. Okay. okay, thank you all. Welcome to all those who are here and those who are with us online as well. And we're really delighted to have representatives from the College of Human Medicine at MSU. And we thought we would start because we really want them to know of our solidarity in prayer and all of our thoughts for them have, after the shooting the other night. So we thought we'd start with maybe just a moment of silence before we move into the lecture. Okay, so, and um, we continue to, to pray with you during this time, and let's pray that no more of this occurs in the future. So I would, again, welcome you to this lecture. We call it the Your Health Lecture Series, and we've been partnering with MSU for quite a few years on this, and we're really glad to have you here with us. So just, I'll just say a few words about what it is, and then we'll introduce our speaker. Basically, we have kind of a unique educational partnership between Aquinas, Aquinas College and the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. And the goal of this Your Health series is to feature physicians and other medical researchers who can speak on really a wide range of topics of interest to, to audiences like students and the public. The speaker actually met with pre-med students prior to this lecture. And um, they had the opportunity to take part in a round table kind of discussion with MSU College of Human Medicine medical students. So we can help our students to know a little bit about what is ahead for them and uh, what might be possible for them in terms of an early assurance if they would like to go to MSU. So now we'll move into the actual lecture. And uh, we're very grateful to have, have you here. So Mark Brave will do the introductions. Well, thank you, uh, Sister Damian Marie. It is great to be back at Aquinas College after a, a short uh, but necessary break uh, from uh, meeting in person. So uh, my name is Mark Brevey. I am the Director of Community and Government Relations at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Uh, MSU College of Human Medicine and Aquinas College have been collaborating on the Your Health Lecture Series since 2013. So that, in my estimation, that's at least 10 years uh, together. And it is an extension of the Early Assurance Program Agreement between our two schools. So I want to thank Sister Damian Marie. I want to thank uh, Dr. Jennifer Hess for helping uh, set this all up for us. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing the partnership between MSU and, the, and Aquinas College. I would like to note that at the conclusion of Dr. Holman's presentation, he will answer questions from the audience and those written into the Q&A feature for uh, those that are, are joining us virtually. Um, before I introduce Dr. Holman, I will mention um, it is my pleasure to actually have Dr. Holman here tonight. Uh, I've known him for a number of years uh, in our capacity uh, as fellow MSU employees, but he actually also happens to be my pr primary care physician. I, he probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to share that information, but I, I'm willing, willingly saying that. So the last four or five years, he's been part of my yearly checkup. So um, I think a lot of what you're going to hear in this talk tonight is probably what we just discussed last month. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Harlan Holman is, is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He's a board certified in family medicine. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan, but he got to the right place after that. He, uh, he actually has his medical degree from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine and completed his residency at uh, the, the Michigan Department, University of Michigan Medical School, uh, Department of Family Medicine. 
uh, where he was chief resident. He's a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Medical Association, and a core faculty member of the Family Medicine Residency Program. His special inter interests include cardiology, dermatology, and preventive medicine. Dr. Holman. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. I want to thank Aquinas again for allowing me to have this opportunity and for Mark. One of the things I love most about my job is the relationships I form both uh, with teaching and with taking care of patients. And sometimes it happens to be where I do both at the same time. Um, so thank you for that moment of silence. Uh, I wanted to say one thing that our uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Souza mentioned in an email that um, to all our whole community, we really appreciate all the support, all the first responders during the incident this past week. Um, and now is the time to really kind of also work on our intellectualism and use our heart to uh, prevent things like this from happening again. So I'm gonna bring up a little bit of gun safety. I modified the talk this week um, to include some of that because that's part of wellness as well. So we're gonna try and stay Spartan strong for this talk. And I'm gonna go over the who first of the checkup because I think that's the most important part. Who, who's showing up, who, what are we doing? comes after the who, and then we'll explain the why at the end. And I'm gonna finish up with like, what's the future of the checkup? Cause I think there's some exciting stuff that's gonna happen in the future with the checkups. So part of my job, 20% of my time at, is employed by MSU. MSU pays Corwell Health, who I work for now. I'm the statewide clerkship director for family medicine. We talked a little bit about that. That's a third year um, required experience that all of our students do at Michigan State. And um, these are some of the uh, locations where our students are at. Um, we had one student that was gonna be up here in Marquette. That's part of the rural program. And I'm gonna talk again about a little bit of health disparities and rural health as part of our talk in a second. But I'm gonna start with the who and um, one of the activities I have our students do is reflect on a patient experience they had during the clerkship uh, and bring in some of the principles of family medicine because I think we stand for these things. And that's kind of part of what we do is the biopsychosocial. So relating to our patients, they're more than just biology. I know a lot of you guys were biology or health professional majors, um, but you know, what activities they're doing outside of uh, work, their work, their family plays such a big role in, uh, in their health care. Coordination of care, um, a lot of our patients see many different doctors, so we're kind of relaying care with them and um, trying to navigate the healthcare system, which can be very complicated for people. The continuity, and I think that's part of the checkup too, is that if you never see a, your doctor, you might not have a good relationship. And then when things go wrong, you won't have that continuity, so they don't know you and you don't know them. Um, complexity of care, I think before I went into med school, I thought primary care just sees people with colds and checkups, and then you realize that no, there's a lot of uh, really complex sick, sick people that they take care of. And the contextual care is kind of seeing a person in their whole um, background and how the illness kind of relates to them. So. I think thinking about all those principles when we take care of patients is a big part of um, who we are. And that kind of relays the, one of the one-time touch points that you have with the, with the healthcare system is that yearly checkup. So um, who are primary care providers? Uh, the specialties listed below, family medicine, internal medicine, they just see adults, pediatrics, med peds is that combination, it's the extra year training, geriatrics, and OBGYN. And then we have advanced primary practice providers, nurse practitioners, and PAs. And of the whole healthcare workforce, if you took 730,000, all of the physicians in the United States, only 228,000 are primary care physicians, and there is a shortage of them. So the more of you that go into healthcare that become primary care physicians, you'll be helping fill that shortage. And then of those different specialists I mentioned before, the majority of primary care physicians are family physicians at 
Um, general internal medicine, again, they just see adults. They're a fair portion of the primary care doctors that just see adults and then general pediatrics. Um, and then our APP partners, um, in that prior slide, you can see the total primary care physicians is 228,000. If you add nurse practice, practitioners and physician assistants, that's about 130,000. So they have a, quite a fair share of the healthcare workforce and primary care as well. And I really think the best way to kind of structure a system is when they're part of the group. Our office has a nurse practitioner that we work with really closely and we coordinate care in that way as part of the healthcare team, but they're doing a big share of the workforce as well. And in many um, underserved areas, they're the only people taking care of patients in some counties. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of ICD-10 codes, but those codes are the different diagnoses that people treat when they send a bill out to insurance company. That bill is like left knee pain is a code or congestive heart failure is a code. So they looked at all the codes that these different specialties um, bill to insurances. So this kind of shows kind of, again, the complexity that we take care of um, a wide variety of things. So uh, an average provider in family medicine will build that many different codes in a year. Um, now the patients. Um, so this is the percent of patients that get a yearly well visit. And um, you can see when you're very young, your parents drag you to see your doctor. And so 85% of zero year olds, or probably, you know, up to the one year old, get a yearly checkup. And then as you get older, the percent of people that get their yearly checkup kind of goes down. And then when you get to this college age group, you can see it doesn't really happen that often. It probably should, although I know you guys are probably pretty healthy in the audience. Um, but it's even a bigger disparity if you look at the gender. Um, I think one explanation why is uh, women sometimes get birth control, right? That's prescribed by a physician. And part of that then is getting your preventative check when you get the birth control. Women sometimes get pregnant. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what necessary screenings are, but pap smears are important for a uh, woman over 21 that they get those done. So, but I will also point out that there's this disparity in men getting their healthcare exams, but there's also a longevity disparity too. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but men tend to live about five years less in the United States than women. And I think, you know, there's no way to kind of randomize control test this, but that might be playing a role that men are not coming in to get their yearly checkups. So we're trying to make it a nice, fun place for men to feel comfortable to see a doctor, but they get really nervous about getting their prostate exam. So um, I try and mention it's not 100% necessary to do that. And um, we have a shared decision discussion about that. There's also a disparity about urban and rural. We showed you that map that we see patients all over the state, um, but rural patients are a lot less likely to get a uh, well visit. The other uh, kind of stress that we as providers have is if you follow all the guidelines and did every single recommended uh, screening test and had a good discussion about that, you'd be working 27 hours in a day. So it's like not feasible to do that. So that's why we need more of you guys again to join our workforce and help us out to take care of our population. And the other who is this is the who rock band. <laughs> and I say that is because one way to kind of address like how are we gonna do it all in 27 hours a day is one to have fun um, and two is to kind of get into a groove and get into a flow while you're taking care of patients. So what is the checkup? Well, there's a lot of different names for it. Some people say, for kids, we often say well child check, well visit, preventative care, annual, physical. I, the one name I don't like that well is the physical because I feel of all the things that happens during a checkup, the fi actual physical part, I'm, this might be a little bit of the controversy here, is the least important. It's actually the discussion and the history is the most important. So I don't know why the name physical has kind of lasted. I'm going to get my physical because the actual exam 
it's important, but not the most important. Um, and then one of the other things you guys met with our Michigan State students, and I think Michigan State is probably a little bit better than some of the other medical schools at kind of learning about the community, but this is kind of called the ecology of medical care. And if you took a thousand people, let's just say in Grand Rapids, 800 of them at some point in the year might have some symptoms, but still not that many of them actually seek medical care. So this on down is those that actually see a doctor. And then um, this is how many actually seek alternative care. And this small little red box here is the number of people that actually go to, do a, go to an academic medical center where medical students are actually seeing them. So it's a little backwards in the training that we give in med school that probably one of the most important things is they kind of get really comfortable with doing these well visits exams, but some of the training is really in this very small amount of um, patient care experience that doesn't really deal with the whole population. Um, so I think the other important part in the healthcare system is money. We talked about the cost of medical school earlier. Um, the cost of the healthcare system is a lot. Um, part of the Affordable Care Act was that well visits are covered uh, and you shouldn't have a copay when you see your doctor. But over the last four or five years, there's been like a little bit of controversy where patients will come in, think that it's going to be free because it's supposed to be covered for a well visit, and then they get this big bill afterwards. And part of that is because they come in with this list of other concerns, and then all of a sudden they get a bill because you can bill both for the well visit and their other concerns, and that causes a lot of issues and stress for people. So just a heads up on that, when you're seeing your doctor, they may deal with other things, but if they do, you may get another uh, fee for that. Um, and then kind of working my way down on what actually happens. I don't know if you guys have been to a doctor's office lately, but often they will give you a flyer even before you see a doctor and have you fill it out and ask about anxiety and depression. Um, and then once the doctor comes in, hopefully they will ask about um, some of the lifestyle questions that you might feel uncomfortable talking about. They may ask about family history, review of your health systems, vitals, do the physical and screening tests. Um, this is an article I've been working with a German colleague who's a visiting scholar on the language barrier. And we just published this paper last year about how the language barrier can impact care. And there's um, a study called NHANES where they go across the country um, and have people come in where they'll take a history and also check people's blood work for diabetes and among other things. And what we did was kind of parse out some of this data to see if, if they spoke English or not and what their diabetes test was or not. And if they were positive for diabetes, if they had a language barrier, they're twice as likely to not know that they had diabetes. So language barrier is a big role. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things we're doing to overcome these barriers later on. I'm gonna leave you hanging there, but just that we know that they exist. Um, the other thing, when you're talking to your doctor, when they start asking those lifestyle questions, do not feel like you should hide anything. <laughs> I think sometimes our patients are worried about that, but if we don't know what you're doing, we won't know how to take care of you that well. So you shouldn't, hopefully there wouldn't be any shame on us for um, making you feel bad about what your lifestyle is, um, whether or not you eat the Cheetos that our students know was uh, crackers he was eating. <laughs> um, but we got to make um, some shared decisions about lifestyle. And then part of any time we're asking questions, I don't know if you guys have heard the technique, motivational interviewing is trying to inspire what you want in your health, how you might live a better life without feeling bad about it. But the other thing too is, you know, depending on what your lifestyle is like, it will inform what type of screening you need. The other thing that in informs our screening is your family history. And so if your parents have cancer, that will impact what type of cancer tests you need. Um, and we're really kind of trying to focus and narrow it down more and more on personalized medicine, but we know sometimes getting the family history is hard to get. My son is adopted from China, so we don't know his family history. And so, you know, there's some disparities there too. 
The other part, I added this about a, a regular wellness exam is talking about safety at home. And this is where um, smoke alarms, recent falls, car seats for kids, um, and gun safety is, is something that we are recommended at reviewing at our well visits. Um, this has been controversial. Actually, in Florida, they banned doctors actually asking their patients about guns, which is really surprising. Um, and then that got overturned. But for several years, it was even illegal for a doctor to bring up if a patient had guns. I don't know if they ever prosecuted anybody, but um, we are not so great, though, about asking about guns. This was a study that was published in JAMA where they changed the electronic medical record, so it prompted doctors to ask about, they did it at the same time, smoke alarms and whether or not your patients use guns. And you can see um, doctors were much better about checking the box here whether or not your patient used smoke alarms and they were about whether or not a patient had guns. This was the overall amount of doctors. And then this particular um, was residents right here and what happened during the two major shootings in Las Vegas and Parkland. And one of the um, interesting things here, you can kind of see the trajectory for the residents, but for some reason, after both of these shootings, doctors were less likely um, to even ask about guns. So I think hopefully for us MSU affiliated team members, we're going to be more motivated, but I know it's kind of a controversial subject for people and um, some patients and people get angry when you even bring it up. So review of systems, again, that, that's kind of asking the head to toe questions. Do you have headaches? Do you have toe pain? <laughs> Anything in between, trouble breathing? But again, you might not be able to address all those things at a regular well visit. Um, your skin, I try and ask about skin if there's any changes because of skin cancer and uh, genital urinary um, patients sometimes are hesitant to bring up those things. If you have trouble urinating or trouble in your sexual life, it's something that if you don't ask, they might not tell you. Um, the what, as far as vital signs, um, this is the one thing like getting your blood pressure checked of all the things your doctor does is probably the most evidence-based where it's important to prevent cardiac disease. Um, basic metabolic, um, sorry, the BMI is your weight over your height. So kind of screening for um, being overweight. Your pulse, respiratory rate, we check those. How often is that really important? It's a little bit controversial, but it's just something that we do. Um, and then an evidence-based physical exam, uh, again, kind of the head through toe, but there's not as much evidence about even doing a yearly physical exam. So if your doctor kind of skips out a little bit on doing the physical exam, don't blame them <laughs> because maybe they were trained that it wasn't as important, which they might be right. But I think there's something about the physical connection with patients too, that if you don't, um, you know, put a stethoscope on them and listen to their hearts. Sometimes they feel they're missing out. And I think with COVID, when we kind of switched to telehealth too, even though we could kind of diagnose maybe what's going on through a, a video visit, there's something missing about not being there in person and kind of putting your hands on a patient. And again, sometimes people don't come in to see their doctor because they're afraid of that prostate or pelvic exam. And I think that I'm very clear to say, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, you don't need to have that done today. Um, screening tests, um, it, it's somewhat standard, depending on your risk factors to get blood work after a well visit. But what exactly that blood work is, again, kind of depends on your risk factors. I'm gonna talk about a couple in a minute. And then other tests that we'll be checking often is the colonoscopy or colon cancer screening mammogram. A DEXA scan is done for bone strength. And again, depending on risk factors, we might order other things. The kind of the Bible, what we listen to as far as what we should do for screening is called the United States Preventative Services Task Force. That's a mouthful. But part of the reason why we follow these guidelines is if it's a level A or B in these guidelines, that means insurance has to cover those tests. So, um, so this one is for colon cancer screening. I, I added colon cancer screening because it is a change. Maybe some of 
your family members might be at this 45 year age mark like me and all of a sudden just over the last couple of years now colon cancer screening is recommended it used to be 50 now they moved it down as a b category for 45. Um, colon cancer screening means colonoscopy but it or it could mean other ways to do it like a stool test um, a colonoscopy is good for 10 years the stool test if you do it, it's good yearly so it's kind of like, do you want to turn in your stools every year or do you want to just get a 10 year test and be done with it? So these are like part of the conversations we have uh, depending on the age group. The other one I kind of wanted to mention is that anxiety screening and again, mental health screening, whether the, you know, the violence in general that was done at MSU was mental health or guns. Hopefully both of those things might come up if people come in to get their checkups and we can have a discussion about them and maybe hopefully prevent things in the future. Um, but this was a new recommendation guideline for kids to get screened on anxiety um, just this year or last year. Um, so we had been doing that for a while in our health system. The USPSTF recommends it, again, to ask these, these kids. And sometimes it feels a little strange. I have a nine-year-old that they would answer these questions. If I don't let him with, you know, use my phone for screen time, he gets very anxious. So it depends on the time when he's filling out those anxiety questions. But then again, it, it's a screener. It's meant to just kind of um, open the conversation. So for all of you guys wondering what you might be due for, and you don't have a checkup planned anytime soon, if you wanna get, there's an app on either the Apple or Android called Prevention Task Force USPSTF. You can plug in your age, gender, risk factors, and it'll come up with all of the category A and B recommendations that you need to have done for your health. Um, so the why, why, why get catch things early um, or things that you might not think are a problem, all of a sudden might be a problem. I don't wanna know about it. Well, if you can treat it early, it can make a big difference. Um, Pre-diabetes, there's changing your lifestyle, but there's also medications now that can help you lose weight, help prevent it becoming diabetes. Sleep apnea, some, that's that guy that's snoring on that picture. That snoring may bother your family members, but also may be causing your health to suffer. It can lead to heart disease too. So bringing things up like that and solve problems later on. And then this slide here just kind of shows if you catch these cancers early, um, survival rates are so much higher on the left, 93% survival rate for cervical cancer versus somebody who comes in where it's detected late, 15% five, five-year survival rate um, for all those different conditions. The other why though, I again, truly believe our secret sauce in primary care is our relationships. Um, and if you'd never see a doctor and you never have this relationship, I think when things kind of get difficult where you have to navigate the healthcare system, um, you might be missing out because it can be a hard system to navigate. And then when you have to make some significant decisions about your healthcare, having that relationship, like Mark divulged with me, like we kind of know, know each other now. And if some, something were to happen, hopefully I'd have a better idea of what um, my patients would want done with their health. Uh, the other thing, the care coordination, again, um, many of my patients have multiple providers and sometimes those providers are better at communicating the plans with my patients than others. Um, so sometimes they'll see a, another specialist and then they'll see me to say, hey, what should I really do? Um, some of my patients have multiple medications and the kidney doctor kind of looks at, this is the best medication for their kidney. The heart doctor is like, this is the best for my heart. And they'll kind of come to me, Dr. Holman, what, what should I do? So kind of seeing the big picture. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing, as we get older or as you may get a more significant health problem, it's always good to have this advanced care planning, what you want done with your health. Um, some of my patients are like, I'd never want to be intubated. I never want to be in the hospital. I'd never want to be on this medication. So knowing that ahead of time, it's really huge. So they don't end up in a place where they don't want to be. Um, the other reason for this is telehealth. I think I really love the idea of seeing me once a year. And then for so many things, I think after that, 
one in-person visit could be done telehealth and that saves everybody time and can be quicker, um, especially then we kind of have a rule too. If somebody's on a medication, we need probably should be seeing them at least once a year, but for adjusting the medication, a lot of times if it's mental health or bl even blood pressure, if they can check their blood pressure well at home, we can do that um, through telehealth. So the future, um, one, I'm gonna go over these four things, the Alexa being in the room with you and the doctor, the point of care ultrasound, precision medicine and health equity. So for Alexa being in the room, um, that earlier slide that I shared with you that it's like impossible to do everything that a primary care doctor is trying to do for a typical uh, patient panel, um, this is where technology may actually be helping us. So it's just kind of starting in our healthcare system where they'll put this Alexa-like device in the room and it'll be kind of listening to what's going on. And as it's listening, it's making the note, making notes for you um, in a kind of uh, organized fashion. And then you could say, Alexa, please order my patient's colonoscopy. And boom, it's like the orders are being done. So. I think that will kind of help. There is burnout in medical school and then burnout in residency and there's burnout um, for physicians in general because there's so much to do. But these hopefully technology will help with that, with the documentation. Many doctors spend a few hours after you see them at the end of the day, sometimes we call it pajama time, where they're on the computer um, finishing up their notes at the end of the day. And maybe technology will also help catch things and cause uh, help us be more safe too, hopefully. Um, point of care ultrasound, um, I think is gonna be the stethoscope of the future. It was a New England Journal article saying it might be the stethoscope of the future 10 years ago. And it's not there anywhere there yet, but we do have these small, so, that picture right there is like the big device. And now there's a small device you can plug into a iPad or a phone. And instead of using a um, stethoscope to listen to your heart, it can actually take an image of the heart. And medical students that were trained to use it were just as good as cardiologists at picking up major heart valve disease. So it, it can be done. It's complicated though. It's not there yet. But I think as the computer might be able to help us um, get better at it. It's going to be potentially taking over the physical. This was an article I made, um, published this twice with um, all the program directors across the country in family medicine. Um, and we kind of initially said, hey, this is an early tool. A lot of emergency room doctors were using it. What should family doctors know about point of care ultrasound for their future practice? And um, at the time, this is like seven years ago, nobody was really doing it. They're saying, we think it might be something in primary care medicine, but we're just not sure yet. And then five years passed, we kind of asked those same questions. And now like half of the programs are doing it. They still are not quite sure where it's gonna be done in the primary care setting, but it seems like it's kind of focusing a little bit right now on if you see a doctor and you have joint pain in primary care, often we'll do injections, but a lot of times those injections are done blindly. So now they're like using the ultrasound to kind of guide where the injections are. And then I'll, the one organ system I feel most comfortable with using it is people's bladders. So a lot of men have really big prostates and it's sometimes difficult with those big prostates to urinate, but it becomes a even bigger problem if they can't, um, empty out their bladder. So what we'll do is we'll have them go to the bathroom, have them come back, scan their bladder. And if it seems like, oh, there's a big balloon still in there, then all of a sudden that prostate problem's a lot bigger problem. So um, I think it will get kind of moved more and more where it's gonna take over the stethoscope. It's just not quite there yet because seeing the heart is a lot harder for me than seeing the bladder. Um, the other thing I had somewhat some interest in is the microbiome. And I know a lot of you guys are biology ma majors. And one thing that kind of surprised me, shocked me was that there's more bacterial cells in our body than um, human cells. But yet right now, when you see a doctor, they're not testing any of those bacterial cells, but they probably are causing quite a bit of the diseases that we have. 
So I think more and more research is going to be going on that's going to move toward primary care. And it might be that in the future, you may be giving a stool sample, not just for colon cancer, but for many other diseases. Um, and then I think some of the DNA testing, like 23andMe, that's like totally outside of the health system right now. Patients are just getting their own tests for this. And I think there's going to be a more of an integration where we kind of talk about it more. Maybe it's done more and more through the health system and not private companies. The other thing is wearable devices. I think my family member might be watching this right now, so I might just mention it that uh, some of my patients and my family members have been worn wearable devices that detected major heart problems. And um, I think those devices, again, not all the screening has to be at that visit, but kind of moving the health screenings outside of the yearly visit. The final thing I want to talk about with the future and um, the yearly visit is to work on our health disparities because we know men don't come in, rural men really don't come in, and then people with language barriers even have a harder time. And then if you're houseless, um, you probably are not often getting your yearly checkups either. Um, and then the kind of diversifying our healthcare system that there are maybe people that are coming in but don't feel comfortable because they don't see providers that look like them or have similar backgrounds. So I think our offices are working on more inclusive inclusivity, but I think that's something our system needs to keep on striving for. And this is a picture of some MSU students. Uh, Mark kind of has helped out with this too, the street medicine uh, at Mary Freebed Houseless Clinic uh, that we run. Um, so I think, you know, those opportunities like that where you guys as students too can get involved as uh, interested in going into medicine and clinics like this. I think it is a great opportunity to learn and help others. And then this, that is my son, uh, Luke, and we were at a health promotion um, recruitment fair for our residency together. So I think our future is bright um, and hopefully you guys will be part of it. So. I think I finished early, but I definitely have lots of time for questions. <clears throat> Any, anybody? I'm happy to start. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and please repeat. Oh yeah. Um, when you talk about yearly screenings, why, why not start screening super early, like? When you know people are like 25, why, why not do every? Why not do a, a colonoscopy starting at 25 every five years? <laughs> right, right. I think you know sometimes it seems like more is better. Um, one is always cost. So you know if insurances don't cover it, you'll be flitting the bill. But you know colonoscopy is a great example that it's a test that has risk. You know, uh, one percent of the population gets a perforation in their colon when they probably less than that, but it, there's a certain amount of people who have harms done from those tests. There's always the false positive when you do tests too, and, and it adds to extra worry. So one test kind of leads to another test, and then all of a sudden you're going through all those tests and it didn't really give you anything. So um, I'd say cost and unnecessary worry. Um, that's part of the worry. I think some I have some patients that want me to get an MRI of their body every year, right? And that's not recommended, but it might help their anxiety out a little bit. And um, I think the point of care ultrasound has the potential where you can reassure people a little bit more that inside of their body is okay without unnecessary radiation and um, unnecessary cost. Yes. For the for the part of the population who needs to be for the yearly checkups, um, and then you correlated it to you know men with shorter women. What what, what would you say is a strategy that would uh, fix that? Yeah. Thank you. I think you know. Okay. Yes. So the the question was for this you know, large section of people that don't see a doctor yearly what are some of the strategies to kind of help overcome that? And I think 
meeting people where they're at, you know, like some of those percent of people are houseless, maybe small, but there's some, um, some don't come in because they don't feel comfortable. There's an insurance issue too, right? Like, I think a lot of people maybe are not even aware that, um, a yearly visit should be covered by whatever insurance that they have. And there are a shortage of primary care doctors. So that's where you guys come in to help out with that shortage. Um, but, you know, we were just trying to find a primary care doctor within the Corwell system in Grand Rapids, and there's not, not too many of them that are taking patients right now. So, yes. We're talking about increasing um, the diversification of um, the primary care provider uh, population and also uh, gets me thinking about sensitivity and how a lot of people um, are just have anxiety about seeing uh, you know their any provider for any reason. Right. And, and people have anxiety when they're sick, like they're not mm -hmm. supposed to be sick, and like so, like you know, I'm a bad person because I'm sick. You know, like, right. It's not rational, right? Mm -hmm. But like, just they have me thinking about whether um, being trauma informed or like. At, whether that's just being worked into the medical school curriculum or in, in training, or is, is that kind of like sensitivity training being worked in to providers that go in? Uh, I'll just repeat the question. <laughs> um, so there's a lot, I think what it was as kind of an observation that anxiety might play a big role in people not coming to see a doctor, and then that some of the anxiety might be trauma related. And if, if there's any trauma informed, um, education in the medical field. And I will say, I think we're getting better at that. Um, I specifically, for the trauma-informed care, I think sometimes it's like recognizing it, right? And then also learning how to um, kind of help people who are struggling with, with that trauma. There's, I don't know if you guys have heard of the ACE scores, but adverse childhood experience scores. I think that's, you know, if, if, your parents divorced, if you moved, if you um, had houselessness, like those level of scores go way up. So kind of recognizing that people may have all the, that, all that trauma, anxiety as they come in. Um, I, I would say we probably could do better, honestly, at that, but I think we're working on it. Yes. Gender identity. Yeah. Um, let me let me see. So so I, the question was how do some of the social constructs on um, houselessness and LGBTQI play kind of a role in um, people getting their exams or feeling comfortable again? Would you say is, it, is that right? Um, I, I think that is, that is huge. And I know like that, that is a barrier for people to feel comfortable to come in because the health system has not been so welcoming to that population. Um, another thing that we're working on, I think we can always be better, but our computer system, again, and uh, we have training at our health system that when you first come in, um, you know, we have to make sure that we have the pronouns, right. Um, and um, again, like programs like Mel Trotter, the street medicine is to kind of reach out to the houseless population. Oh, yes. Would you say a little bit more about the point of contact ultrasound for, for heart? What kind of things could be monitored? Yes, yeah. So point of care ultrasound for the heart. Um, I think there's kind of two things that you could use it for. One is screening for like valvular disease. Um, so, you know, typically we'll hear a murmur and then we'll order a test called the echo, which is like an official test where an ultrasonographer um, does the ultrasound of the heart. And then they'll send that to a cardiologist and a cardiologist will read it. Um, so the point of care, and actually this kind of gets at your point too, I think, any test that you can do that's point of care, I think, where a person who's houseless 
who has like barriers to go to a study. Um, if you can do a rate right at the office at the time, I think you, the, the, the chances that it'll get done are so much better than these, I'm gonna order this test. Now the patient, person who has trouble with the bus, you know, they have to go to a place that works on their schedule with a bus route. Um, so I'll intermix your questions together, but um, so it could look at uh, valvular disease kind of for screening, but it also can look at the size of the heart. Um, people with elevated blood pressures, their heart is like a muscle, right? So it gets bigger and bigger. Um, and you can kind of see that on the ultrasound and see if their heart's working harder. And you'd be like, you know, if they do have, we call it left ventricular hypertrophy, if they do have that, we got to be a lot more aggressive to treat the blood pressure. So, and then does their heart pumping or do they have congestive heart failure would be another thing that shouldn't be too hard. If you get, I, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I think the future is with better training in primary care that a primary care doctor could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Getting back to the screenings, it, it seems like the recommendations change. And, and can you talk a yeah. little bit about that? Why that might be the case? Okay. Do I need to repeat your question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you got. So uh, the question was recommendations kind of change from time to time. Um, and, it, and you were asking like, how do you kind of manage those changes? And then I guess, why are there changes? <laughs> um, and you know, that's the thing, the thing about research is it kind of builds on itself, but so occasionally there's these like landmark studies that come out to show either yes, it's worth doing this test or no. It's not. And so um, when those studies kind of come out or more evidence points to you should get a colonoscopy now 45 versus 50, um, sometimes it's slow for providers to know. I think with the digital age, it's a little bit better, but uh, our system, there's like a committee that kind of looks at those guidelines and then puts it on the computer system. And there's like flags for some things, but not everything on that list. I, shared with you. So, you know, hopefully it's, it's part of the training, but it's one thing that we train our residents too, that you should kind of always need to be studying. Like you're not done after residency because things change all the time. And, and part of the, you know, a physician has to go through continued medical certifications and stuff like that. So you have to keep up with your training too that way. Can you also speak a little bit to screenings, like specifically what are maybe the top three for men, top three for women, generally what age? Okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I guess for both colon cancer screening, um, you know, the, that's one of the most important, I will say, for cancer screening. And that starts at 45 for everybody, unless you have that family history. And then it's 10 years before, if you have a first degree relative, 10 years before that first degree relative's diagnosis. So if you had a first degree relative, your dad, your sibling had it at 40, then you should get your screening at 30. Uh, and then for a woman, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening. Um, and the cervical cancer screening starts at 21. Um, one difference that's somewhat new is once you get to 30, you can screen for both the virus HPV and the cancer at the same time. If that's negative, then you're good every five years for a woman. Um, and then uh, mammogram breast cancer screening, you should uh, have a discussion starting at 40. Again, unless you have a first degree relative, then it's again like 10 years before that first degree relative. And then for men, I'll hi highlight the prostate cancer screening. That one's been a little bit more controversial. Um, that's one of the examples where it's actually kind of gone back and forth between recommended, and not recommended. And so I'll use that shared decision with my patient, but often it's, if a patient has multiple health problems, they're older, they're probably going to die from something else other than prostate cancer because prostate cancer is very slow growing. Um, but if you're actually young and healthy, that's somebody I'm more prone to actually start having that discussion and maybe screening when they're 40, 40, 45, because if you catch it early, they're probably gonna do well with the surgery and, and um, it'll save them you know, later on. Uh, 
Are you guys are going to go out and get your physicals, right? Did I convince you? <laughs> Maybe one more question. Yeah. On wearables, are you talking about Apple Watches, like Fitbits, or are you talking about uh, things like that? I guess I'm not like wed to any one. I, I think the family member I had was wearing an Apple Watch, but I think, um, you know, there's a ring, I think, that monitors your sleep, right? And I, I'm not recommending any one particular thing. I just think that there is so much information that can be gleamed outside the regular visit that right now we're not really connecting with, but is a big part of people's health that we probably need to be. Any final question in the room? All right. Well, with that, uh, let's thank Dr. Holman one more time. Thank you. And I uh, want to thank you all for coming. And uh, again, thank you to Sister Damian Marie and Dr. Hess for the great uh, hospitality. And we do really appreciate the, the relationship between uh, MSU College of Human Medicine and Aquinas College and um, look forward to working more with you in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.